Welcome to the Discover Montcalm podcast, where we're going to take a look at the communities, the businesses, the attractions, and the people that make up Montcalm County. Here is your podcast host, Dwayne Weed. Hello, and welcome to this episode of Discover Montcalm. We're going to go back and we're going to look at the history of Greenville through a video that I produced back in 2004. I worked with Linda Collins and Elsie McNeil, and together we put together this short little history using some old photographs and a script that Elsie had written. For those of you that are listening to this, you can also catch the video of it on discovermontcompodcast.com. We also have a YouTube channel under the same name if you want to go and check out any of our past episodes. But on this one, you'll be able to see the video. It was a pleasure of mine to be able to work with the Flat River Historical Museum and to kind of document some of that history. The video was funded by the Greenville Area Foundation. I'd like to take this moment right now and thank Jody from Busy Bee for supporting this program. She provides these mugs, and if you come in as a guest, guess what? You get one of these mugs. But we also, more importantly, we get the opportunity to tell your story. So if your business or organization is in the Montcalm County area, reach out to me, 231-250-9624. I'd love to set up a time to interview you. And if we could, maybe even come over to your business and we'll do a walking tour. So that way we have the video of it, but we also have the audio that we can share with others. So right now, Let's jump back to the video that I did in 2004 on the Greenville history. The city of Greenville was named in honor of the John Green family, which settled here in June of 1844. The Greens, John, Deborah, and their four children were natives of New York State. Before reaching their future home in Montcalm County, they first stopped at their Denverist relative's farm in Otisco Township, Ionia County. Leaving his family there, John, Samuel Demarest, and Samuel's two sons headed north probably following one of the Indian trails which laced the area. Among the several trails, there were two prominent ones which intersected near the present Washington Street Bridge. One came from Ionia in the south, passed through the future Greenville, and continued north through the present Lakeview. The other trail came from Saginaw. After crossing the Flat River, it led past the Indian village, located on the western bend of the river, and went northward to Pentwater. The men selected a site east of the village to erect a shanty for shelter, then constructed a dam across the river and built a sawmill. These structures were here where Franklin Street now crosses the river. With these projects completed, the men returned to Otisco, where Green retrieved his family and brought them to their new home in Eureka Township, Montcalm County. Josiah Russell joined the Greens in November and the following year, with the help of Thomas Myers, built another dam and sawmill just north of the present Fair Plain Street. Farmers soon arrived and took up land to the east, west, and south of the river. A carpenter, blacksmith, millwrights, and Dr. Thomas Green, John's brother, settled near the Greens Mill to serve the needs of the growing population. By 1850, 456 people were living in Eureka Township. To the north of the river lay a vast forest of white pine trees. At first, the trees were cut and turned into lumber for local use, as there was little profit in sending them to downriver markets. After the Civil War, demand for wood products dramatically increased. During the winter, thousands of trees were cut, hauled to the banks of the Flat River, and piled there to await the spring floods. In the spring, when the snow melted and raised the river level from the runoff, the trees were rolled into the river to be floated to the mills. White pine was a lightweight wood and floated high in the water, but occasionally a snag would occur and create a tremendous log jam. It took great skill and courage to untangle the mess, which sometimes resulted in a loss of lives. Several saw, stave, and shingle mills were located along the river in Greenville. Not all the trees were processed here, but were sent downriver to mills in Belding, Lowell, Grand Rapids, as far away as Grand Haven, and across Lake Michigan. The finished products at first were made up into rafts and floated downriver to market. After the Detroit, Lansing, and Lake Michigan Railroad came to Greenville in 1870, the finished products were shipped out by rail. The river continued to be used for floating logs out of the woods. A peak was reached in 1881 when 165 million board feet of logs passed through Greenville. 
Therefore, the amount decreased until the last run in 1890. With all the pine near the river having been cut, lumbermen laid tracks into the woods and hauled logs out with small trains. After the trees were gone, lumbermen sold the land to farmers who employed stump pullers to clear the land for planting. The stumps were put to use as fencing to keep the animals and deer away from the crops. Among the farmers were immigrants from Denmark who primarily settled in the Gowan area, some of whom later moved into Greenville. Their contributions to the community are honored by the annual Danish festival. The land was ideal for growing potatoes, with Greenville becoming a shipping center for the tubers. Potato storage warehouses line Lafayette Street next to the railroad tracks. With one and a half million bushels of potatoes being shipped from here each year, locals claim Greenville to be the potato capital of the world. Another prominent crop was grain. The Middleton Mill was the largest mill in Greenville, processing up to 500 barrels of wheat a day and shipping them as far away as England. Butter and eggs were also sent from here in large quantities. Farmers would bring these items to the J.T. Ridley Egg Emporium for cold storage until they would be sent out to cities in the east. Ridley, in his biography, stated he shipped 170,000 dozen eggs and 12 tons of butter a year. His warehouse is now the Flat River Historical Museum. Industry sprang up in Greenville to support the needs of the lumbermen and farmers. Several foundries were established in Greenville to make and repair sawmill and farming equipment. One of the earliest was I and T. H. Peacock Foundry, founded in 1872 at the end of East Grove Street. It was purchased in 1874 by Samuel Tower and remained in family ownership for over 100 years. Early products were the Gordon Howell Blast Gray and Tower Edger. In later years, the company manufactured, among other things, soda fountain equipment and the tower truck. The company now makes automotive stampings and is known as Tower Automotive. The Moore Plow and Greenville Implement Companies were devoted to making and repairing farm equipment. The Implement Company later diversified into manufacturing washing machines, boats, and boat motors. Of these named companies, only Tower remains in business, although no longer family owned. Calkins and Son produced barrels so Midton Mills could ship flour overseas. Ranny Refrigerator Company, founded in 1892, put to use the hardwoods which remained after the white pine was gone. The company manufactured wood refrigerators for home and commercial use. After several changes of ownership, the company is presently known as Northland Refrigeration. Skinner and Steenman Sideboard Company began manufacturing in this city in 1904, but went bankrupt in 1909. Gibson Refrigerator Company was organized in 1908 and took over the factory the next year. It too has undergone several changes in ownership and is presently owned by Electrolux Corporation of Sweden. The Christensen Tanning and Glove Factory began business on East Cass Street in 1904 to make use of animal hides furnished by local farmers. The company began a division of Wolverine Worldwide in 1930 and no longer has a plant here. Francis O. Lindquist began manufacturing mortar garments in the Rutan block in the early 1900s. Known as the Man from Michigan, he changed his product line to men's and boys' wool suits, selling them through mail order. To spur sales, a premium of a free $1 Ingersoll watch was occasionally offered. He later moved the business to Grand Rapids. We hope you're enjoying our podcast, and we'll be back after we thank our sponsors. West Michigan Technology and Design Solutions, your IT and web hosting experts, westmichiganhelpdesk.com, and DW Video, your source for video production, websites, and your local videotape, slides, and 8mm film transfer specialist, dwvideo.com. Now, back to our interview. In front of the Rutan building stood Greenville's first schoolhouse, the education of children was important to the early pioneers who built a log schoolhouse in 1845 at the center of what would become Lafayette Street. Twenty-five children attended that year, six of whom were Indians. That structure was replaced three years later by a two-story, two-room red schoolhouse on the northwest corner of Lafayette and Cass Streets. Student enrollment increased, demanding a larger four-room school which was built several blocks to the west on Cass Street. This one lasted until 1901, when it was replaced by a red brick building. It later became the city library, then school administration offices, and now a glider museum. 
Other schools built in the 1800s were the North Ward School on Gibson Street and the Clay Street School. The latter is still in use as a VFW hall. The need for a high school became apparent, so the Union High School was erected in 1868-69 at the south end of Franklin Street. It was the first brick building in the recently chartered village of Greenville. Unfortunately, it was gutted by a fire in 1911 and a new school was built on the same site. A new school was built on Hillcrest Street and this one was torn down in 1977. The Flat River Community Library now occupies this site. Circuit riding ministers held early religious services in the Red Schoolhouse. The Methodists were the first to formally organize a congregation in 1851 and built their own church the same year. It was replaced in 1872 by a much larger structure which was destroyed by an arsonist in 1951. A new church was built at the same location on the corner of Cass and Franklin. The Congregational Society organized in 1852 and met Sunday afternoons in the Methodist Church until they built their own in 1856. This building was sold to the Episcopalians in 1879 and moved from the northwest corner of Cass and Clay to the other side of Cass. The two congregations shared the building until the new Congregational Church was completed. The Baptists organized in 1853 and built a church in 1865 on the corner of West Washington and Franklin. St. Charles Catholic Congregation was organized in 1859 and they built their first church on East Washington Street in 1877. The Episcopal and Baptist church buildings are the only original buildings still in use. In 1853, John Green planted his land west of Lafayette Street while Manning Rutan planted his land east of the street. Most of the homes in the beginning were built to the west of Lafayette, becoming the commercial district. By 1860, bridges were built across the river at the north end of the street and on East Washington Street. Earlier, the only way to cross the river was over the two dams. This is the first known photo of Lafayette Street taken about 1867 when Green Settlement became a chartered village. Among the first acts of the new government was to order plank walks built across the muddy main streets intersection which the men in the foreground are doing. The second floor of the gabled building in the center of the photo served as the council chambers until a combination fire city hall was built in 1872. It was enlarged in 1905 when the Victorian facade was replaced with a colonial style architecture to match that of the new addition. This building was tore down in 1985 after the adjacent City Hall and public safety buildings were built. This 1875 view of Main Street shows a mixture of wood and brick structures. The Fargo Belknap block on the far right was the first brick commercial building in the city built in 1869. A devastating fire in 1887 burned all the frame buildings to the north almost to Cass Street where it was stopped by another brick building. Flying sparks then ignited the Phelps Hotel across the street, which is the second building from the left. Water stored in the large cisterns at each street corner proved inadequate to put out the blaze. As a result, the city council decided it was time to construct a community waterworks. The hotel was soon replaced by a modern brick one, as were the buildings on the east side of the street as seen in this 1948 picture. Greenville's first hospital was established by Dr. Belknap on the second floor of the Fargo Belknap block in 1905. The hospital was moved to the former F. O. Lindquist home on Berry Street in 1915. When the baby boom occurred in the 1950s, a new hospital was built on the west edge of town to ease the space crunch. Here are some early Greenville homes built for prominent businessmen which are still in use. The home of banker A.J. Ecker was built in 1876 at 615 South Lafayette. It presently contains several apartments. Cass T. Wright had his home built on the southwest corner of South Lafayette and South Streets in 1890. He was part owner of the Greenville Implement Company and raised several record-setting horses on what was then a farm. A longtime druggist, Charles W. Passage, had this Victorian-style house built at 200 South Franklin in 1896. It has been used as a doctor's office for many years. William D. Johnson, a lumberman, was the first owner of this house at 121 South Franklin. Burt Silver, a showman and owner of the Silver Theater, was the next longtime owner. 
The house was built in 1879 and now contains residential apartments. This brick house on the corner of West Washington and Lincoln Streets has been the least chain since it was built for Rufus F. Sprague in 1886. Mr. Sprague was an industrialist involved in several local enterprises. The present Marshall Funeral Home at 418 West Grove originally was the home of Thomas B. Winter, built in 1896. Winter was the owner of the Winter Inn at the corner of Lafayette and East Grove. The restored inn is the third hotel on the site, the previous two having burned down. Lumberman J. E. Oliver had a horse breeding farm at 737 East Fairplains. He had this farmhouse built in 1890. It is now an apartment house. The city of Greenville not only has the flat river flowing through it, it also has three lakes at its southwest corner. The largest is Baldwin Lake, which is a little unusual in that it has a road circumventing its shoreline. Because of the high ridge surrounding the lake, the water level was lowered several feet in order to build up the road. The lake became a popular summer resort, with bathing and dance pavilions attracting visitors. Mir Lake, adjacent Mondoka Lake, was originally named Fatal Lake. The original name was due to a legend of an Indian maiden, Mondoka, drowned while trying to save her sweetheart. The lake's name was changed to romanticize the legend. Como Lake was outside the city, but has since been annexed into the city. The Flat River, once vital to the industrial economy of Greenville, has returned to a more serene state and a place of beauty. On behalf of the Flat River Historic Hill Museum and myself, the Greenville Area Foundation, Busy Bee, we just like to say, remember to buy and shop locally. Connect and subscribe to Discover Montcalm Podcast at discovermontcalmpodcast.com. Follow us on Facebook, Instagram, and YouTube at Discover Montcalm Podcast. To be featured in an upcoming show, contact Dwayne at 231 231- Two five zero nine six two four. Remember to subscribe at discovermontcompodcast.com.